Good evening. My name is Jessica Weaver, and on behalf of the Future Forum, I want to thank you all for joining us for our discussion on women in leadership tonight. The Future Forum is an organization that brings together individuals with different backgrounds, experiences, and points of view to discuss the most important issues that affect us all. Our goal is to create informed, civil, and bipartisan discourse, which is perhaps needed now more than ever. The Future Forum's events are made possible by our incredible members and sponsors. If you are not a member of the Future Forum, I strongly encourage you to sign up before you leave tonight, or at the very least, visit lbjfutureforum.org to learn more. Tonight's discussion is part of our annual series on women in leadership, which has explored a variety of topics, including building diverse and inclusive teams, the competing professional and personal demands women may face, and most recently, a conversation on women in government featuring Madeleine Albright. I'm incredibly excited to begin tonight's discussion focusing on the historic mobilization of women in politics. Please keep in mind there will be time for questions at the end of the panel, and I hope you'll all join us after to continue the conversation and enjoy the reception. And now I'll turn it over to my colleague, Alexa Ura, who covers politics and demographics for the Texas Tribune to introduce our guests and moderate our discussion. Hi, everyone. Can everyone hear me? I don't know if it's, there we go. Thanks for coming. My name is Alexa Uda. I'm a demographics reporter for the Texas Tribune. As Jessica mentioned, we've got about 40 to 45 minutes of conversation, and then I'll open it up to questions. So enjoy your drinks and get your questions ready toward the end of the panel. Uh, we've got a great um, panel uh, set up for you who have very different experiences in the political world. Uh, to my left, we have Gina Ortiz-Jones. She is the Democratic candidate for Congressional District 23, a massive district that runs from San Antonio down to the border and up to the El Paso area. She is a former Air Force intelligence officer. Next to her is MJ Hager. She is the Democratic candidate for Congressional District 31, which runs from Round Rock up to Temple. She is also a former Air Force, she is also a member of the Air Force. She was a combat search and rescue helicopter pilot. Next to her is Randon Steinhauser. She is a GOP political consultant who is a co-founder and partner of Steinhauser Strategies, which specializes in PR and communications. And last but not least, we have Cheryl Cole. She is a Democratic candidate for House District 46 here in Austin. She previously served as mayor pro tem for the city of Austin and was the first African-American woman elected to Austin City Council. Thank you much for being here. So when it comes to uh, underrepresentation, I'm often sort of the Debbie Downer of the office when I start looking at the numbers. And I know there's been a lot of talk this year about the intense mobilization of women in politics, particularly among women looking to run for office. But according to the Tribune's number crunching, both the Republican and Democratic ballots heading into November will be dominated by men. And even if every woman running for state and federal office were to win in 2018, Texas women would still fall short of equal representation in their government. At the Capitol, for example, women make up only 20% of the legislature, and nationally we rank 35th when it comes to representation. So I'm curious, when, when you look out to this landscape of underrepresentation and really how far behind Texas is, what is it about our state, in your opinion, that's, that's left women so far behind? So the easy questions have started. <laughs> I mean, I think we can we can look at some of the obvious things, right? I mean, we could look at some of the things like gerrymandering. We can look at some of the things like voter suppression. All of these things that I think uh, lead people to sometimes question, you know, sometimes the effect of their vote. Well, what does it matter? And I think that disproportionately affects uh, districts like this one. As you mentioned, this is a district that runs from San Antonio to El Paso, 538 miles across. 70% uh, of the voting age population lives in San Antonio. So while it is large, it is quite compact. But you can imagine, you know, what was the intent of the person that drew that line? Right, right. On what planet could one person feasibly do a good job of serving a district uh, that this is the largest congressional district uh, that is not its own state, right? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. 40% of the U.S. borders in the district, uh, and a majority minority district. So you have to look at, uh, again, the effect that this dispor disproportionately has on, I think, the future of this state, uh, already a majority minority state. Yeah, I think it's a lot of things. I think it's a combination of things. Um, I think that people have a very short memory. 
And when we say things like we are the state of Ann Richards still, um, we, we do need to elect more women on both sides of the aisle to office to show um, and give, give role models and, and build that next generation of leaders. Um, but I believe that we need to be focusing on removing the barriers that women face to run. Um, I don't know about these ladies, but I've had a lot of experiences facing some discrimination, which I'm not um, new to because I was in a male-dominated career field in the military as well. Um, but I definitely think that I have a responsibility as a female candidate to stand up and stomp out aggressively anything that I see that is misogyny and discrimination, not because of how it impacts my race, but because of how it impacts other women who would run for office who see that and say, that's a good reason not to run. Um, we need to do more and do better about um, affordable childcare. Um, when you run at the congressional level, uh, it's very difficult to do if you don't quit your job and not a lot of people are in that position to be able to do that, that's a barrier. Um, so I think that w that's what we need to do is focus on electing more women and especially women of color and you know, remove barriers. Yeah, I would just add that I don't think Texas is unique in this. I think it's a national issue that we see less women running for office. Uh, this year, perhaps more than ever, we've seen that momentum increase for women running for office, um, specifically on the Democrat side. Um, but I would just say, you know, as a mother of three, that that seems really daunting to me to just put everything aside and run for office. As women, we often see ourselves as problem solvers, um, but at the same time, we sometimes have to be asked to run for office, and that's something we hear a lot from candidates. Um, I served as the chairperson of an organization called Maggie's List, which is sort of the conservative response to Annie's List, and oftentimes, women that we would approach about running for office, it just seems so daunting. How do I fundraise? You know, where do I begin? And, and I think that whether it's a man or a woman, and specifically in this case for women, um, a lot of it begins with just resources and education and identifying those people who are interested in running for office and providing that encouragement. I agree with you that it's, I don't think it's a Texas thing. <laughs> yeah, just women in office is, um, it's just a big challenge, but I think the, the major challenge is the, um, I have a family, I have kids, how do I do this challenge? And I've given kind of mentoring in the speech over and over again. Excuse me, did you say you were married? Yes. Did you say you had children? Yes. That means you know what generations to come means. That means you have an obligation to run for office. I would echo that because, yeah, please. I would just add to, you know, while this is not a Texas issue, the fact that it is a Texas issue uh, disproportionately affects the future of the country. I mean, we could talk about this, the same issue in Wyoming, but, I mean, one in 10 kids in this country don't school, go to school in Wyoming. One in 10 kids in the country go to school in Texas, right? The fact that we've got 36 people honored to call themselves representatives in Washington representing the great state of Texas, only three of them are women. Only two of them are Democratic women. Now, granted, they're both uh, women of color. Uh, but the last time we sent a new woman to Congress was over 20 years ago, right? So when we look at some of the health statistics, when we look at uh, you know, some of our rates of educational outcomes, I think all of those, you can tie a direct line between our representation and Austin and in Washington. So I think, uh, you know, while it's not unique to Texas, I think Texas does bear a lot of the responsi uh, uh, responsibility moving forward just because of the disproportionate number of young people in this country that live and go to school in Texas. And I think that we don't do a good enough job of not just saying run for office because you're a woman. Run for office because you're needed. It's like, have you ever... Do you have a church secretary? Yes. Does she have a uh, business kind of background? Yes. That's why. Because you bring a whole new perspective that is missing from our country. So you can't go home, turn on the news, and complain and not give your talents. Because the, what you know that's not there is part of the problem. And I always give this example. I was a PTA president was a bit more thinking about office. They recruited me, I got on the PTA, and the first thing I said is, well, where are the other working moms? And there was this big friction between the working moms and the non-working moms. And I was like the first PTA president that had been a working mom. So I just went after 
all the working moms. Like, I don't have time. I don't have time. Well, you know what? She's not going to be, you know, the golden girl Sally. Okay, 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 Cheryl. And, I go, and then once they started doing it, it just changed the entire school. The entire school. It changed it for the kids. It changed it for the boys. It changed it for the teachers. It just it changed the entire school. Something that simple. Well, and you know, I think in the past when I've talked to groups that are working to recruit women and helping them run mm -hmm. for office, I've heard what you know what you mentioned, Rand. And a lot of times, people are hesitant to have to fundraise, or you know, there's this sort of notion that women have to be asked to run more than men might be. And I'm curious for for Gina MJ, considering that you're sort of in that wave of first-time candidates in this surge um, of Democratic can women running for office. Did you feel a sort of sense of urgency that outweighed some of those traditional barriers? I mean, did those did you consider those things, or was was there something else that encouraged you to run beyond some of the typical barriers? Um, I mean, it certainly factored into my decision. I don't personally nor professionally come from wealth, uh, but anyone who has started this process knows uh, for some of the kind of decision makers that would be in this process, uh, that's always the first question: is can you raise X? hundred thousand of dollars, right? Uh, and so it's, it's very daunting. And, they, and yes, they tell you, you know, like, well, map out your network, educationally, professionally, socially. Uh, and look, I have been in public service for 14 years. And again, I was raised by a single mother, right? There was not a lot of money for, for education, much less a rainy day. So I knew this was not gonna come from, from my network. Um, but I, frankly, the most motivating thing was, you know, I, I uh, knew exactly how my country and my community invested in me that allowed me to do everything that I've done in and out of uniform for our country. And so I had to think about, you know, everything that was done for me to, to allow me to go on to do what I've done and, and the, the need to want to protect those same opportunities uh, that allowed me to grow up healthy, get an education and serve my country. The desire to protect those opportunities outweighed my fear about, can I do this? It was more of, I, I will do this, I will figure this out, just like I figured everything else, like just like MJ's been quite successful in a number of things that she's done. Uh, because, you know, this was not, it, it, for as, an, as a member of the LGBT community, as a veteran, as a woman, as a first generation American, it was just clear that we were going to have to stop assuming that somebody was going to come to save us. We'd have to save ourselves. Yeah, I've always had this really irritating personality disorder where I see something that I think is wrong or unjust and I just just attack it. Um, it ruined my military career because I sued the Secretary of Defense and there's no coming back from that. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I think a lot of the things about politics were just making me irritated. I was irritated at the apathy. I was irritated at the lack of women. I was irritated at the importance of money. And while I had successfully avoided sales my whole career, um, I was on an executive track at Dell and was you know, told by my mentors, you have to do a stint in sales if you wanna go anywhere. And I said, I'm a, I think I'm okay, I'm not that ambitious. I'll be fine here at this level because I don't wanna do sales. And then I gave up my paycheck and gave up my ambition and finally found myself as the VP of sales of my campaign <laughs> by accident. Um, and I think if I had known that, I don't know, I would have maybe hesitated to, to do this. But um, I really think I set out to do those things. And a lot of women will say that, you know, they're, they're kids, they want to focus on their kids. And I have small kids. And that was something that I've faced some discrimination about is people inferring that I'm not a good mom because I'm running for Congress while having small kids. And really, um, I never saw it that way. I never even for a second thought, well, I won't be here for them. I actually bring them to most things. Um, I'm surprised I didn't bring them to this. I usually, I mean, this would, would really interrupt bath time. So, um, but I do bring them to most things. And, you know, I'm doing this for them, not just for their future. But I was at a meeting um, and I was speaking and I sat down and it was another candidate's turn to speak and my three-year-old was uncharacteristically being loud. And I was like, what do you need? What can mommy do to get you to be quiet? Um, and he said, it's my turn to speak. I want the microphone. And I was so proud. I was like, That's yes, my kind of guy. That's right. Don't you let anyone silence you. Now go in the parking lot and tell daddy all about it. And <laughs> you know. So I think the things that normally traditionally stop us are the things that motivated me. Um, and and I, I think that comes from having a, a history of great examples to, to follow, and I'm cognizant of that, as I know these other ladies are, that we are um, examples. And, and the more that we do things like this and events like this, um, no matter how far the drive, no matter how what time is if it's bath time, we, it's important to do these things for that specific reason. 
You know, and on a separate panel earlier this year, I spoke with State Representative Helen Giddings, who is retiring, and, and we talked about what seems like a, a lack of progress in getting women elected to the state legislature in particular. You know, during her first legislative session in 1993, there were 27 women serving in the Texas House. During her last legislative session, 24 years later, that number went all the way up to 29. And, you know, I, I, I sat down with her and I wondered, you know, given, given everything we know about how hard it is to run for office and 24 years later, the, the idea that only two more women were at the Capitol, you know, what is, is the underrepresentation of women a retention problem or a recruitment problem? Which one do you attack first? Well, we work very closely with a lot of the members in the legislature, including a number of female senators as well as members of the House. And I have definitely heard from more than one of them that it is quite lonely uh, to be a woman, whether you're a Rep Republican or a Democrat in the state legislature, and that there is a strength in numbers and that sometimes you just need to vent to another woman about the day at the Capitol. And I think that there's a lot of frustration. I mean, if you've spent any time in the Capitol, you know that that is not a cheery place where you want to spend your a lot of time. And so I think that, um, you know, that you do have to find strength in other females that are in that same position. And since there's not a lot of them, it can be somewhat discouraging. I see it as more of a recruitment problem as opposed to a retention problem because if you recruit people, the right people, they will stay. And I think the recruitment in where we fall short is really not communicating your value and your need. And just talking about it in terms of the same way we would talk to a male, that doesn't resonate with us. Um, so when you say, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, men just like, oh, power or what, you know, that type of thing. I mean, I don't think we groove to that same type of thing. But when you say no one else understands a autistic child. And so if you don't go, I mean, well, that, well, I guess maybe I've heard from one person all session that came in and they're trying to start a club and do this and that and this. It's just, it's, it's not happening. And you have one. And so is your brother. So if you bow out, it's gone. Everybody understands cancer. I think also it depends on finding the issues that you're passionate about to kind of build on that. I mean, you know, so often we hear about women's issues, but women's issues include the economy and foreign policy and, you know, health care reform and all exactly. of these ideas that we have discussions say, yeah. with our girlfriends or our friends about and, you know, taking that and, and, and corresponding that with you can have an impact. You can change policy, and it doesn't just have to be a dinner table conversation. You can actually take action to be a voice on that issue in a way that you care about. Um, I think just putting that perspective out there and saying, what are you passionate about? You can make a difference is, is really empowering. You know, I think an interesting dynamic that I haven't heard discussed a lot is the idea of, and, and I've said it myself, um, don't just run because you're a woman. Don't just vote for someone because they're a woman when for hundreds of years, if not longer, we've been voting for and supporting people because they're men um, when, when, when faced with a choice. Um, and I think when, when good, strong female candidates on both sides um, run for the state legislature, I don't think that it's a negative thing when you agree with you know, both people's issues in a primary maybe, or you're kind of torn between the two. I don't think it's a negative thing to say, we are underrepresented by women. And this is a good opportunity for me to shout out to Meg Walsh, who's running for Senate um, in my area, in my district. And I think that we need to seek them out and support them. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Well, you know, I, I think we, we know women of color have historically been underrepresented in Texas politics, though Democrats have been moderately successful on that front. Um, but the underrepresentation is even worse for women who are part of the LGBT community. And unsurprisingly, some of the challenges that come with being a member of a marginalized group transfer over to politics, if not in worse ways sometimes. And Gina, I was at a Democratic candidate forum earlier this year during one of your primary opponents pretty blatantly went after you after your sexual orientation. And, you know, I'm curious what it's been like to navigate these sort of attacks as, as a candidate and as a woman who's part of the LGBT community. Yeah. 
Uh, I, must, I was surprised myself, right? I was, had to pinch myself and say, I am at a Democratic primary, right? Uh, Democratic primary forum. Um, but yeah, I mean, this, it, it shows you that it's, it's, it, I was just surprised that there are still people like that, that they, they, can, they can be part of, of our party. I mean, our tent is big, but it ain't that big, right? Um, so, um, and so what I, what I have done, though, and I think why, why, the team, why we've been successful is um, I've been very open. I mean, yeah, you would think that there are, you know, have I gotten the question, you know, what's it like to run as an openly LGBT woman in Texas? And I say, look, I bring my full self to this, right? I'm running in a district uh, that is, has 4,000 dreamers in it. We have uh, between Texas and California, we've got 50% of this, nearly 50% of our country's dreamers. And so what I talk about to show them that I know a little bit of what it's like and, and why we need to fix this issue, um, is when I had my ROTC scholarship that took me from John Jay High School in San Antonio to Boston University as a four-year Air Force ROTC scholarship, uh, Don't Ask, Don't Tell applied to me. And so I tell folks, you know, I live in, I knew, I know exactly what it's like uh, to live in fear uh, that an opportunity that you worked hard for, opportunity to get an education, opportunity to serve your country, that that could be taken away from you through no fault of your own. So while I'm not a dreamer, you know, I have to empathize with our dreamers at the University of Texas at San Antonio, uh, Sol Ross State and Alpine, University of Texas at El Paso, these dreamers that are doing everything that we want them to do uh, and live in fear because folks can't keep a promise that we made to 800 hundred thousand young people. Uh, so, you know, I, um, uh, if, you know, if you're going to come after me for being LGBT in 2018, I think it probably says more about you than it does about me. Um, yeah. But it's been important to you to turn around some of the experiences you've experienced. Yeah in order to empathize with some of your constituents. It has been, and I mean, and I say, look, I'd be honored to be the first out member of Congress from Texas, but it is more important that I am not the last. Speaking of underrepresentation, um, in the legislature, women are particularly underrepresented among the Republican Party. Um, the underrepresent underrepresentation only worsens when you look at just Republican women of color. By my count, there's only one um, and in the legislature. And when you look at the House, for example, you've got 95 Republicans, only one of which is a woman of color. And I'll preface this by acknowledging, Brandon, that you don't speak for all Republicans. <laughs> but I'm wondering, you know, given your experience within the party, do you feel that the party is doing enough to elect women, particularly women of color? Yeah, I think it's an important conversation, and I know it's uh, an important topic that has been had at the state level of the party as well as within the legislative body. Um, you know, I think we also need to represent or recognize Eva uh, Guzman, who's on the Supreme Court as a Latina GOP woman. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, I think that it comes down to the issues that we talk about and the way that we talk about them and the rhetoric and how we talk about issues that we care about. Um, I'm a conservative, first and foremost, and the Republican Party is a vehicle for the ideas that I care about. And so if we're talking about recruiting candidates, I think that we have to be very mindful of our rhetoric and how we approach topics ranging from everything from immigration to healthcare to education. And so, um, you know, I think we probably could do a better job of recruiting candidates into in minority communities. Um, so I think that there's a lot of room for improvement there, but I know that the party has done a significant amount of work uh, reaching into Hispanic communities and African-American communities. And every Juneteenth festival in Texas, we try and have a GOP booth at. We try and connect in these communities, and we're, I think we're, we're doing a good job, but there's certainly room for improvement. You know, I, I'm not sure we can have a conversation about the underrepresentation of women in politics or the mobilization of women in politics um, without really addressing the, the Me Too movement and sort of the sexual harassment that's rampant in, in the political field. Um, you know, I'm, I'm curious what your experiences have been either as elected officials or candidates or, or working in the political arena um, with either sexual harassment or even more generally sort of the boys club that persists in politics. How have you had to deal with that in your different areas? Yeah, I think that the movement is probably helping in this environment um, because it's making some women, I've, I've been the victim of sexual assault um, and sexual harassment and discrimination. Um, I think that it's making some, and, and almost who hasn't, right, been a victim of something, um, making us feel safer in being able to engage in the boys club and being able to come in these environments and feeling like we're gonna be believed when we stand up and say something. But what I have found is interesting is the, that it's still um, not where you would think it would be in 2018. It's still far back and that goes for both parties. I mean, 
I've experienced it with with some of the the members of I, I, a member of Congress actually who I had an awkward interaction with, and then I mentioned to a team member of mine, and she said, "Yeah, we're aware. We're working with him on it." And I'm like, "What? It's 2018. You're aware, and you're working with him on it, and his, this is still happening." So, um, I mean, I think we have a long way to go, um, but I'm glad that we're talking about it at this forum. I'm glad that that people are talking about it on social media. I'm glad that we're talking about the. Um, you know, the uh, uh, backlog of rape kits and just the, the culture, and it's not just the backlog of rape kits, it's what culture allows something like that to happen. Um, and I think that while we're addressing these things, it's an important first step to women in leadership positions, either in politics, also with board members and CEOs. We're so far behind the rest of the industrialized world. I mean, we have, at one point, I'm not sure if these statistics are still accurate, but I think it, by 2014, and I'm pretty sure it is still accurate, um, we had uh, fewer women representing us percentage-wise than Afghanistan did in their government. Um, so I think we have a long way to go as a country and, and as a world, but I think that we're moving in the right direction. I think that the Me Too movement has been overall a really um, eye-opening experience, and I think it's been very positive for those individuals. Um, like you said, pretty much every female has probably had that experience. I certainly know that I have professionally. And I think that um, in more ways than one, it's emboldened us to say, no, I'm not here to take notes. I'm here to lead the meeting. So sit down and let's get to work, right? And I think that that mentality has allowed us to say, you know, whether you're a young woman, an older woman, a Republican, a Democrat, um, we have done a really good job of fighting for our seat at the table. And I think that this movement has just allowed for us to capitalize on the leadership opportunities that we're all capable of taking over. The angle that I find interesting, and of course I support the, the movement and think we really just can't do enough on these uh, issues. My only concern sometimes is that we talk about it too much in terms of, a, I don't know, a sexual issue as opposed to a power issue. And then we sort of miss the whole point, you know, <laughs> being Americans, you know. And so I, I definitely would like to, to see that because I really can't say that I've experienced a lot of that. I mean, of course, it's experienced discrimination, but not sort of the sexual harassment avenue of it. And I think it's because it's a, it's, it's a power issue. And so if we don't really hone in on what's going on with the women, then we don't really address the problem. So that's, that's one, focusing on that. And then the, the second thing I've noticed is males kind of want to um, tell me secretly about the women who, you know, throw themselves at them. And, uh, and, 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 I, and, I, and I believe them, but it's kind of like, well, that's not what, what we're talking about. But, but, um, but, but, but it happens so frequently, it makes me think that maybe we should stop just dismissing that because that might be what is stopping us from moving forward. So let's just get that out there. Perhaps also thinking about it from the perspective of women running for office, um, you know, there's been several times, I, I served on the state Republican executive committee, um, which is the sort of governing body of the Republican party in Texas. And I was actually the youngest female ever elected to serve on the body. Um, and that was an endeavor to recognize the, the need for a younger voice on the kind of board of directors for the party, for the Republican Party of Texas. And I remember when I first kind of explored the idea of running that there was sort of a, and I'm sure some of you probably have experienced this, but that's cute. That, you know, that's a good, good idea, you should do that, you know, go for it. And I think that when you really put your mind to something, especially I think as women, if we're gonna work for something, we're gonna work really hard and we're gonna win. And I remember someone asking me like, you know, kind of why are you running? Well, I'm running to win. If I'm gonna run and I'm gonna <laughs> represent this position, I'm, you know, I want to win. And I think that oftentimes we fall into this, Not doesn't necessarily fit into the Me Too conversation, but it sometimes does fall into this, well, good luck. You know, kind of that, just talking, the condensation I think we feel. Sure. 
is why I think it's so important when we talk about not only this movement, but then the importance of having representation that'll act on that, right? It's Senator Gellibrand, actually, that I want to say tasked the Department of Labor uh, to really study, you know, the effect on the economy of, of sexual harassment. And, and because it disproportionately happens, obviously, to young women, right? And so when that disproportionately happens to women at a certain point in their career, at the time in your career where you're supposed to be moving up the ladder and you're actually only moving horizontally because you're jumping from job to job to job every six months, right? Because you're being harassed, uh, then that affects you in the long term. That affects uh, your contribution to the economy. That affects, obviously, the entire workplace. But again, it took somebody like her to say, you know, this is a moment in time where we can ask this question um, and really try to fully understand the economic effects of this, let alone the, the social as well as the justice issues around it. Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting when we've been reporting about uh, the response to reports of sexual harassment at the Capitol, there was this sort of effort to both have women lead the conversation and lead the resolution, and also the, say, say, the sort of saying of, this is why we need more women. And I, I couldn't sort of not think about whether that sort of comes very close to having women have to clean up after other people and sort of putting pressure on them to have to find the solution for a problem they didn't necessarily create. And I'm wondering if, if as you approach either running for office or working in politics, if, if that's something that you have to think about as a woman about the priorities that you might have to take and whether you feel any pressure from outside movements about what you have to prioritize that a male colleague might not have to. I've never thought of myself as a woman first, honestly, and maybe that came from growing up in a male-dominated field. I was never a female pilot. I was never a female soldier. I was just a pilot. Um, so I, maybe I should feel that pressure, um, but I, I think I'm gonna feel the pressure of making sure my district has jobs, making sure we have a strong economy, making sure our kids are healthy and taken care of, making sure people have access to infrastructure and, and quality, affordable healthcare, and those are the things I'm gonna feel pressure to fix. I mean, I think, uh, you know, I would feel, frankly, a little bit guilty if I didn't go there with this mentality of, you know what, I'm gonna do all that I can do given my background, right? So yes, let's talk about the economy, right? I, the last portfolio that I led was at the office of the US uh, Trade Representative in the Executive Office of the President, and we looked at the intersection of economic and national security issues, right? So yes, I'm very much looking forward to helping bring this, you know, potential trade war to an end, right? Because this disproportionately affects, again, certain parts of our country that are already disproportionately affected by, uh, by flawed domestic policies, or frank and, and frankly, you know, being part of helping inform the conversation as veterans that have been to war and know the human cost of war, and you can't just tweet recklessly and put men and women's lives in in danger without knowing again what we what we're doing uh, and the full ramifications of that. So yes, I'm I frankly am, am not shying away from this idea of yes, I'm going to go help clean this up because that's exactly what I aim to do. Yeah, I think it goes back to the experiences of not just being a woman, but your life experiences, and I think. Um, you know, personally, I feel like I have a complete and utter obligation to be unabashedly pro-life. That's something for me as a mother that is a non-negotiable, but I also work quite a bit in education. And for me, that is something that I'm very passionate about. And so whether it's just coming at it from a woman perspective, but I think it also just goes back to those individual experiences of what do you care about and then being the voice of those issues and hopefully doing it quite effectively so that the first thing they don't think of when they see that spokesperson is, oh, she's a woman. It's, oh, she's effective. Right, that's way more important to me at the end of the day is that I'm an effective spokesperson for these issues that I care about and not just a woman who cares about them. There's no such thing as a woman's issue. Reproductive rights, I mean really, I mean it's just how do you, education, that affects both, I, I don't, there's just, I don't believe that. I just, I refuse to just embrace it. I mean these divisions that, there, there's no such thing, I mean, what uh, officer-involved shootings or those African-American issues, I mean, as soon as we get into the business of making a issue or a problem with our country just belong to one gender or one race, we've lost. I wanted to talk about um, the mobilization of women in politics who aren't running for office, many of whom, examples of which are in this room. You know, I think we're in an era where 
despite the sort of voter apathy that we see at the that we've seen at the polls, election after election, there seems to be you know some sort of movement, engagement, mobilization of people that we haven't necessarily seen before. And I'm curious for for those of you who have worked both on the local level and now running for higher office and worked all you know different levels of government, what your advice is to women who want to become engaged. I mean. The, I think the idea of running for Congress is a little scary for most folks, but I mean, what is an easy way in for people at the local level? I mean, what's your best advice in sort of the political atmosphere that we're living in now? To show up, like literally, right? Go to your county uh, Democratic meeting. <laughs> um, literally, I mean, if you're not running, you should be helping a woman run for office, right? Uh, and there are a lot of women running, as you just mentioned, but there are also these wonderful groups, the Indivisible Group in, in, in Texas 23 and throughout Bear County. They've been quite effective. Uh, so literally, I think it is just a matter of first showing up, uh, seeing that it's really not as daunting as you think, um, and you're going to make a huge difference uh, it, for that candidate and certainly for the community. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I was an activist for women's rights, although I called myself a human rights activist because that's how I felt. Um, advocating to open jobs for women in the military because it was silly that we had 238,000 jobs closed to women for ground combat just because we were women when we were in ground combat all the time and I was medevacking women off the battlefield. Um, you know, but I, I, I didn't feel like I was being political. Um, it wasn't until my Congress said they were going to legislate the ban back in place after my Pentagon repealed it that I got political in a hurry. Um, but I, I encourage people to, you know, and, and I, I want you to volunteer and, and get involved in my campaign, but uh, I will say that, you know, a lot of times when you get involved in politics, something happens and you lose, you, you, you take a hit. Your candidate loses or your candidate has a scandal or, you know, something happens that makes you feel deflated, and I think, yes, support candidates, but support the issues that you're advocating for. Um, and those things don't have to necessarily be politics. I was fighting to open jobs for women and to make our military stronger, um, and then it turned political because it was about a law. Um, so I would encourage people to just stay active and engaged in the issues that drive them, find the candidates that share their values and call them and with low expectations and say, how can I help? And maybe what you really can do to help is knock on some doors, do some phone banking. I have volunteers all the time that are like, yeah, but I really want to feel like I'm making a difference. And I'm like, we can't do this without you. You are making a difference. So stay involved. Try to not think that you're going to change the world with your first, I mean, all of us together working in unison locking arms, that's what changes the world. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I mean, I think, you know, sometimes a disadvantage of having a two-party system is that you don't always fit into one box or one camp. And so if you are really passionate about the immigration situation that we're facing right now and the border security, find an organization that's working on that topic. And inevitably, it will become more political. But if you... If you get involved in politics because you like politics, then something's probably wrong with you, right? Like, no one really likes politics. We care about issues. And so all of us on this stage got involved because we're passionate about issues, and we're passionate about causes, and we have a philosophy. As I mentioned earlier, the Republican Party or the Democrat Party, it's a vehicle. Right? At the end of the day, we have an ideology, we have a philosophy, and that's driven by the causes and the issues that we care about. And so if you get involved in those issues and those causes, inevitably you will find out which legislators are carrying a bill that supports that cause, and maybe you can volunteer in their office or volunteer to knock on doors for them. But you know, start with the causes that you're passionate about as opposed to politics for politics sake. I couldn't agree more. Follow your passion. Or you just won't be able to do it. I mean. It's got to be a flame. Well, we're close to running out of time, and so I, I want to close with, with a question to each of you. Is, you know, obviously, people are excited. There is a surge of women running for office, despite my Debbie Downer statistics. Um, women continue to pack into... Not just your statistics. There are <laughs> statistics true. that, that we got to fix. Uh, but, you know, women continue to pack into these workshops of, of how to run for office, how to become engaged. Um, but in the past, when I've written about this issue, inevitably I get a reader email or a tweet from people who say, you know, why do you make this about gender? Why should I care if my representative is a man or a woman? And, you know, I think it's probably a little bit more complicated than, like, than you know, strictly like that. But I wonder for each of you, you know, what is your response to those individuals? What is your case for electing more women into office? So I had a male candidate say to me, 
Um, I do think we need to have more women in office, um, but I think I should be elected because I will go and fight for your rights. <laughs> and, and that was well-intentioned. And I have no doubt he would vote the way I would want him to vote, but it was condescending to hear someone say, I understand your struggle, I understand the, the, uh, the obstacles that you've faced, I understand the um, solutions that you've seen that have been tried that didn't work or that have worked. Um, because he didn't say, tell me how to best advocate for you. He said, I will best advocate for you. And I am cognizant of that when I'm talking to communities of color. And I think I'm not going to go out and patronize and say, I will represent you. I come and say, join me and let's represent you together. And let's be solution oriented on some of these things that we can do to, to, to do some good. Um, so, you know, I think that we absolutely need more people of color, women of color, women, veterans. We just need our, our legislature on both sides to look more like our population, more like the electorate, because as well-intentioned as you are, you cannot effectively, 100% effectively, you can try, um, advocate for and represent people when you haven't lived their lives and walked in their shoes. I'm curious for the rest of you, what, what's the case either for electing women or having engaging women in politics? I think she said it. I mean, I think that's exactly right. You you want people that understand your experience, and um, you know, I think recognizing that women inherently are problem solvers. I would argue, and I love surrounding myself with strong women. I love finding younger women that I can mentor and, and bring up. And that's one of the, I think the highlights of my career is honestly having mentors and having mentees and recognizing that there's these generational differences between women that we can really build off of. And I think at the end of the day, if the gender was switched in Congress, we might not be in the situation where we are today. And, and I just think that there's something to be said about more women running for office, Republican or Democrat, at the end of the day, you have to take the step to do it and find your passion, find your calling. Uh, and I, I think we would see some really strong results from women being able to work together. Putting Games of Thrones aside, I don't know a woman that's ever started a war. Oh, Helen of Troy, sorry. Okay, maybe one. I mean, we just belong as a part of the system because we are the system. And you just can't have half of them there and complain. I mean, if we need part-time government because we have to work and do childcare, then that's what we need to do. But the idea of us being out should not even be acceptable. And, and I don't know if that's an African-American sort of view of the world because I do notice it when I talk to uh, Anglo women that I find very interesting, just even the premise that, well, how could we possibly not be there? Why are we still with this, this fight? It just, it doesn't, it doesn't work. We're here. We have to be at the table. Let me, let me, I, I'll ask you a question. I'm guessing that some of these uh, questions about, you know, well, why does it have to be about a woman? Are these primarily from men, by the way? Right? Like, <laughs> You know what I mean? Yes, they are. Because I'm just, if there I'm just, any doubt. yeah, as I look at the questions on my, on the questions and comments on my own Facebook page, right? <laughs> Campaign page. But I mean, I think, uh, I, I think um, being very uh, critical and very honest about, uh, again, who, MJ said it quite well. I mean, I, I will echo that in terms of, you know, who is going to fight, who gets the issue, who is going to advocate for you, who's going to go to the mat on the issues that you care about, right? Who literally, in these times, who is going to go to the mat on the issue that you care about? Um, and I think for those of us that have that have served in a different ways and, and have different identities that we look that we don't necessarily see at, at the table and and see that as a deficiency in the conversation, uh, you know, I forget who said it originally, but if you're not at the table, you're on the menu, right? So we've just got to remember that. Uh, moving forward. We're going to go ahead and open it up to questions. We've got a mic going around. I think we're going to start up here in the front, and then I'll get to as many of you as possible. Uh, my one request is please end your question with a question mark. I really don't want to cut anyone off, but I will if I have to. Um, we will start up here. Yeah, before we open it up, excuse me, to the larger group, I'd like to take a moment to recognize one of our longtime Future Four members who is running for Texas House District 47, um, just west of Austin. So Vicki Goodwin. Thank you. 
thank you all for running. And I have a, an, a unique question. So I've been running as well, and I know myself that it's a little bit of a slog on a daily basis having to make all those fundraising phone calls. So I just wanted to go around and ask you if you can give us a bright moment along the campaign trail. And as an example, this last Saturday, a woman held a, an event for us um, in her backyard. She wanted to make it family, family friendly, so she had a foam pit and um, it was Saturday, and so as she was introducing me, she was talking about the current event of the family separation, which of course is a very hard topic, very sad, and you know, she was, she was being the Debbie Downer. And then all of a sudden, some of this foam from the foam pit came flying up through the air and went behind her, and it just gave us a little bit of levity at the party. So I thought it would be fun to hear from you some, maybe a bright spot, spot along your campaign. Uh, you know, I received this wonderful letter. Uh, so I, yes, I empathize with uh, these, these calls, right, that we have to make. Um, but I remember it being late one night and the, um, I'm getting the mail and there's this wonderful letter from a young man from Del Rio because this the, the district includes Del Rio. And he's talking about, uh, you know, um, how he was very excited to support my campaign and he talks about his life history, how he was also raised in a, in a household um, that is a uh, minority and he was raised by a single mother and up until he was 12, when he was able to get on CHIP, uh, his health insurance plan was essentially the emergency room, right? And then he remembers watching his grandparents kind of struggle to pay the bills and, uh, and cutting pills in half and whatnot. Uh, he was so proud though, he was the first in his family to go to college, uh, but what is unfortunately now faced with making a decision about deferring law school because he faced a medical, uh, a medical emergency and now was having to, 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 um, to pay for that. Uh, and that wouldn't sound like a bright spot, for, but for me the bright spot was this, this young man uh, reached out to me and he saw himself um, or somebody that could advocate for him and his family uh, in a way that he hadn't seen otherwise. And so to me, that was very encouraging after, uh, you know, you think you've got it tough and then somebody, you know, shows you that, you know what, you've actually got it pretty good. Um, so it, it's things like that that just remind you of what's at stake uh, in, in this election um, and the good folks that are out there that are willing to support you if you've got the courage to run. Yeah, I think um, we're sobered and, and confronted every day with the gravity of what we're trying to do here and the amount of people's literally lives that are in our hands. Um, and being no stranger necessarily to that, being veterans, um, I, you know, I, I kind of bounce from low to high, to be honest with you. Um, and, I, and I have a poster in my office that I wrote on why I'm doing this because there's moments when I have to look up at it and read and remem remember why I'm doing this. Um, and I go from you know, having my son in the emergency room because he bit through his tongue and just being devastated and scared to death to see blood coming from my one-year-old's mouth and just being freaking out about that and yet hearing a three-month-old coughing like in a way that would make me nervous if my husband coughed that way um, and listening to her parents talk about whether or not they could afford to be there. Um, that was a low point in, in my, you know, that was also a, this is why I have to keep doing this. Um, to you know, going and, and feeling like I miss the camaraderie of the military, I miss the mission of medevac and feeling like I'm saving people's lives and pulling them off the battlefield, I am pulling people off the battlefield. Um, and, and having a mom come and talk to me and say, the things that you talk about about national security, um, she, she got emotional, as I am, um, saying that her son was in Afghanistan. And when I talk about the dismantling of the State Department, the relationships with our allies, the handling of nuclear powers, the things that we're doing, the, the enemies we're creating now that we're gonna have to fight in 20 years. Um, she says, she prays every day that her son is gonna come home alive and that she has faith, she's placing her faith in me. She's gonna give me $25, $26 if she can afford it. Um, that is such a responsibility when someone says I'm gonna vote for you, I was unprepared for that burden, that's huge, or I'm gonna donate to you um, because I, I think you might help save my son's life. So those are my like low to high points. Yeah, I'm not running for office, um, but I think uh, being a political consultant in Texas, and um, I started our company, Steinhauser Strategies, when I was 25. Um, I was raised by a very strong, hardworking single mother. And I think now being the mother of three daughters, it's uh, super exciting for me to be able to be a woman-owned business and for me to be able to be a role model for three young girls that are gonna be able to see their mom be passionate about issues that she cares about and 
be able to do that for a living. I think that's a really high point. My uh, baby boy, youngest son, is a senior. He just graduated, but he came home at the launch. And, um, you know, in the campaign, you're always talking about dollars and cents. And I remember somebody saying, well, you know, your, your son took some T-shirts or something. And, and then it was months later, and he started sending me these text messages and they were his friends in his fraternity with my shirt on, and he's in Philadelphia. And my campaign was so pissed that he took all these shirts, you know? <laughs> and so we have these kids from New York and all these places in these shirts. And so anyway, I just want y'all to know, it gets better. <laughs> you really, they really do start to get into it, yeah. We'll take another question. We've got one up here in the front, and then we'll go over here. See, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so I recently spoke to my 17-year-old niece and asked her if she was excited to turn 18 and have the opportunity to sign up to vote. And she answered me with a resounding no. And it was disheartening to hear that somebody at a very idealistic age had already made up her mind not to participate in the process. What advice would you give me to encourage her to find a way to help her connect with the issues facing our country. So I feel like I keep jumping in first. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, you know, I I would I would argue that I would need to know her better and know what drives her and what inspires her and what makes her passionate. Um, so for me, I'm a, a student of history. I love the Revolutionary War. I love the Constitution. And for me, when I need to to get my faith back in the system and in my vote and remember why it's important. You know, I used to be the voter rep in the military. I would sign people up to vote. And I had somebody say to me, a woman, um, oh, no, 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 my husband votes for our family. <laughs> and I almost lost it. Um, but I said, you know what? That's your right. Okay, that's your right. But I stay engaged and I am an active voter because I feel like we don't have to fight another American revolution because our forefathers gave us the weapons with which to fight our revolution. It is our voice and our vote. And that excites me and makes me passionate because I'm a nerd and I like studying the Constitution and stuff like that. So I think of it like I'm taking up arms and I am changing our government by going and voting and dr dragging other people with me. Um, but I would say find what it is that drives her and makes her passionate, either an issue or um, an analogy or something like that. I talk to people all the time that say, I don't want to talk to you. And I say, oh, they say, you're a combat veteran. I don't want to talk to you. And I say, oh, but I'm a Democrat because most combat veterans <laughs> are Republicans. And they say, doesn't matter. I don't care. Either party. Mm. I'm seeing more and more in that on the campaign trail. People don't care what party you're from. They don't want to talk about politics. They don't want to talk. They think that both parties suck. They don't want any part of it. And I say, all right, if you're that frustrated with the hyper and toxic partisanship, find the people who you think won't be like that and support them. You know, it's no um, coincidence that we have record low veteran representation of people who have to jump into a melting pot and work with people who we're unfamiliar with or work with people we disagree with and keep the mission at the forefront. We have record low participation and record high hyper toxic partisanship. Um, so pe a lot of people, not just your niece, are, are disenfranchised. And we've got to find what makes them excited and talk to them about that. I think, exactly, you've got to find the issue. Um, I always like to use the analogy, though, and I think it works uh, sometimes with, with younger people better. Um, you know, when you were younger and your mother said, uh, well, if you don't eat this, you're not eating dinner. Uh, you're just like, all right, fine, because you know you're going to eat essentially 12 hours later, right? You can, you can, you can uh, uh, tough, tough through it. Um, this is not like that. Right? You will eat something. You will have a representative that determines whether or not you have access to safe reproductive services. You, have, you will have a representative that votes on whether or not the quality of the, of the result of your search engine is based on the type of data plan that you have, right? which then, again, disproportionately affects certain communities. You will have somebody that votes on whether or not uh, you can have assault weapons or whether you cannot. Right? So this is, this is a time where somebody will advocate on your behalf. Now it's just a matter of what 
what is that person, who is, what drives that person, what is that person, who does that person hold themselves accountable to, right? Is it actually the constituents or maybe is it maybe just some, some very uh, narrow, frankly, nefarious uh, um, special interest? So putting it that way, I think, is, 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 can be helpful for folks that think that they have the privilege of not being part of this process. I would ask, um, does she have a job? Yes. Okay, well, tell her to look at her paycheck and circle FICA and circle all the taxes that she pays and help her understand that those dollars go to a government that represents her. Um, maybe show her the process, bring her to the Capitol, or if she can't come to the Capitol, pull up a YouTube video of a hearing. I mean, I think that it's important for, especially, you know, I got involved in politics at a, a young age because I had a paycheck and I wanted to know where were these dollars going and why were they spending my money um, you know, being a strong fiscal conservative, that was important to me. Uh, but maybe just showing her the process and, and allowing her to be a part of that is, is really important. Um, there's some great programs at the Texas Capitol, if you are a high school student or a college student, to be a page or an intern. Um, it sounds kind of geeky, but it might be something that she ends up enjoying. Make sure you circle Social Security, too, and ask her if she wants that money back. <laughs> I think we really have to be careful because the, the issues with the the young, 18, to before you own a house, I think are very different than the uh, people who are frustrated now by partisan politics. So young people, um, that is always a tough nut to crack until you uh, actually have bought a house or significantly paying taxes and I actually didn't get engaged until till that happened. Um, but, but I still think you should do all the other things that were suggested. But what we're seeing now is interesting because like with the Bernie Sanders and the, is you either have the young people totally engaged or apathy, there's no in between. And so I just think we could talk forever about that difference. And then where we are as a country is at a new low because we're just, we're so mad we're just doing nothing. I have a 17 year old daughter. <laughs> yeah, I just wanna add um, that I have a 17 year old daughter and I encourage her to engage with me in conversations even where she disagrees. Um, and, and I'm not, this is gonna make me sound awful. There are times when doing this all day, every day, it's the last thing I wanna do when I get home and having a discussion, um, sh her information level is here especially when she's grounded from her phone like she is now. Um, and, and it's frustrating. It can be frustrating for me because I'm so informed and I'm just like, and I want that equal in that conversation. And then I remember, wait a minute, I'm not having this conversation with her so that I can win or something like that. I'm doing it to stoke whatever ember is making her ask me this question. Um, and I want to fan that. And even if she disagrees with me, I just want that interest and that curiosity and that wonder. We'll go, I think, ma'am, you had a question. I'm not sure how we're doing, we're doing on time, but I'll get to you back there if we've got the time. We might, we'll squeeze you it. Sure, I have a whole bunch, but I'll pick one. Um, and the one I'll pick is, what do you think women bring to the table that men do not? <laughs> other, I mean, other than anatomy, right? Um, <laughs> That's hard. I mean, I wouldn't even want to uh, get into making blanket statements because I would be, frankly, very offended if someone were to blanketly say that women don't bring this to the table because I just, I just don't accept the premise of the question. So I'm, I'm not going to answer that one. I think I also, I just want to add that I think it's important as we have this discussion about women and getting involved in the system that there are some really awesome men, my husband included, who's constantly pushing me and constantly saying, you can do this, you got it, you're going to win, you're the best. And I think it's important in this discussion to recognize that there are some really empowering men out there that are constantly pushing for women to run for office or women to start a business or women to be in charge. And um, I think that they, they deserve some credit too. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. Um, I am going to answer the question because it came up in the context of my race because there, if, if, if I would not be still in the, the running for the seat, there would no longer be an African-American representative for the Central Texas region. So the question of, well, you, how is he going to vote different than you and why come he can't represent this district? 
I mean, what's so special about being black? And that's kind of the, what's so special about being a woman? And, and the answer is just different experiences. It's just different experiences and bringing those experiences to bear on different problems just helps. It's a salad. So I do a lot of college football analogies. Okay, so bear with me. <laughs> and, and I often ask people, what's the most important position on the football team? Now my brother played college ball and he would disagree with me, but let's just say for argument's sake, it's the quarterback. Who would want to take a team of quarterbacks to the Super Bowl? Not me. Um, and I think that what you could say is that women do bring in, and other groups, there's plenty of, of them to choose from, we could list them all night, um, bring strength because they're not there now. And we bring diversity of thought. And a team is stronger when you have people with different experiences and different skill sets and different strengths and different weaknesses. And I put the brakes on with my team when everybody agrees and everyone's nodding, I say, okay, wait a minute. No, because we need to have a, a better conversation about this. So we bring that. Um, and, you know, I, I think that there is something to be said, at least in combat, um, because the question often was asked, what do women bring to combat? Um, there's, there's a great study um, with the UN on how women in combat roles and then women later in military combat leadership impact the um, war crimes and things like that. And it's not just what women bring to the table, it's what, what happens to the team dynamic and the room when women are in the room. So that's um, something that I would talk to you about offline. We're going to go back there, and is this our, going to be our yeah, last this, question? This will be our last question, but I encourage you all to continue the conversation. We'll have a reception immediately following, so thank you. So my question is actually um, kind of related to what you were just talking about. I feel like one of the um, arguments that I've read a lot you know, on Twitter and elsewhere um, recently is that if we elect a bunch of women, they'll be a lot more collaborative, they'll be better at bipartisanship, and I'm just curious as to whether you think that's a valid statement if we think that's, if you think that's true or if it's just kind of another brand of sexism. I find that to be a compliment, right? I mean, if, <laughs> I, mean I, I think if, if you've got a bunch of people that are going there to, to get something done and not going there for a title, I mean, that is how, that's how we get to where we need to be as a country on national security, on these domestic policies. If you're talking about you know, the long-term strength of the country, uh, then yeah, we've got to talk about immigration and healthcare and this and that. Uh, so, I mean, for somebody to say, if, we, if, if a bunch of women go up there and try to solve this and, and try to work together and get something done, I'm like, yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, you know, um, I went into combat with men that I wouldn't turn my back on um, or men that I would take a bullet for. And I went into combat with women who I wouldn't trust and women that I would take a bullet for. And I, and I think that that's important that I carry with me into this. Um, that I'm not going to say I disagree, though. Um, not because I would say if I were to pick a random set of women, we're gonna do better than a random set of men. I don't, I think that's a false equivalency. I think there may be something to the type of woman who runs for office and then succeeds getting there. And the type of, you know, that there would be a problem with the data if we were just looking at the fact that they're women. Um, you know, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I would say that I would see it as a compliment. And I also think that our country is so divided right now and it's so polarized and it's so one party versus another that I believe and I hope that if there is a new wave of women coming into office from either side, that we would see it as an opportunity to find areas of common ground. We're not going to agree on everything and we're probably not going to agree on very much. But one of our clients is Congressman Michael McCall. And he just introduced and passed a bill on childhood cancer, pediatric cancer bill. And this was a bipartisan bill. He's the uh, co-founder of the Pediatric Cancer Caucus. And for, for this bill to pass, one of the only bills that can be bipartisan passed right now is childhood cancer bill. And I think that there's examples like that that are very meaningful um, where you can find common ground. And you know, I would hope that if, if there's a wave of women who come into office, that we could find areas of, of improvement such as that where we could work together. Cheryl, I'll give you the final word. Gosh, say let's send all women and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, folks, thank you so much for coming. Let's give our panel a round of applause.